As a doctor who graduated in the 1980s, I hardly ever came into contact with a computer. Although all the management staff in my private hospital uses computers to do crucial tasks, I never really went beyond the papers and the pen. My two kids, Laya 12 years and Sam 14 years, are pretty good at using the computer and the internet. Even my wife manages to pay all the bills online. But despite being a surgeon, I'm not so good at using the computer or the laptop. So, to put an end to this issue, I asked my son to teach me the basics of the computer. I must say, taking computer lessons from my son was pretty fun. In the first few sessions, I became a pro at using all the basic features of the computer. However, we haven't yet started using the internet. You may have guessed it by now, but I didn't have an account on any social media platforms, so my son was going to help me set them up. He also told me that having social media accounts would make me more popular and get me more patience. And I would do anything to get more patience. So, as the days passed, I had an Instagram account, a Google account, a Facebook account, and a LinkedIn account. Although it was fun at first to find relatives and friends on these social media sites, I quickly grew bored of them and used them only for work and promotions at my hospital. Day by day, I was getting more and more familiar with these apps. One day, I was using my son's laptop while he was at school. A notification popped up in my browser. It said, Do you want to get more patience, Dr. Phillip? Back then, I wasn't much aware of the negative aspects of the internet or how people are tricked into doing bad things. So, you could guess how ecstatic I was when I saw that personalized notification. I clicked on the link below the notification and when I did that, I got a warning from the browser that this wasn't a safe site and that if I clicked on that link, I would be exploring the dark web. I had no clue what the dark web was and honestly, the opportunity of having more patience and more publicity had blinded me for the moment. I clicked on the link and a sophisticated looking web page popped up. It asked me to fill out a form which would have all of my details and soon I got an email. It was an invitation to a party that would help me to network. But there was a catch. I was not allowed to bring a plus one. Meaning I would not be able to take my wife with me. But Jeanette gets bored in my doctor's conferences anyway, so this was a boon in disguise. The party, or should I say so-called networking conference, was going to be a week later. I had my best suit out and a bunch of my business cards in my pocket. I was glad that I started the social media accounts and learning the computer, otherwise I would not have gotten this opportunity. I reached the party and it was nothing special, just a high-end party with lots of food and booze. For a moment, I thought this was some prank and someone had taken advantage of my lack of digital education. But soon, some of the famous people in our city showed up at the party, and I saw my chance to network. I was having a good time, eating delicious food and having a drink every once in a while. That's when suddenly, the music came to a halt, and all the people cleared the dance floor. There was an eerie silence, one that you only encounter at funerals. There may have been 10 to 15 people wearing black robes with conical tall black hats walking out in a line. They surrounded the dance floor. I found this part of the party quite strange as none of them were showing their faces. Every single one of them had a devilish mask on their face, and each mask was scarier than the other. For a moment I thought about my teenage daughter who would have been terrified by this scene, and especially all the horrid looking masks. But my attention was transfixed on the dance floor, in the center of which a small baby lay down. From my experience, I could say that the kid was a few months short of being a year old. The spotlights on the dance floor were focused on the baby, and so much brightness must have made the child cry. I could not spot the baby's parents anywhere in the audience, as no sane parent would expose a young kid to such a harsh light. Nevertheless, no one stepped forward to rescue the kid. Instead, one of the masked figures stood beside the kid. He said something in Latin, I guess, and then the rest of the masked men started drawing symbols around the baby with colored powders. The kid's cries were the only thing anyone could hear besides the chanting of some sort of Latin spell by the masked men. Soon, the leader of these men drew a knife and sliced the forehead and arm of the kid. I could tell from my seat that it wasn't a deep cut, but it still drew blood enough to make the kid shriek in pain. As a doctor, my first instinct was to go help the kid, but 
I somehow felt compelled to sit and watch like the rest of the people there. Then, the so-called ritual ended, and the masked men approached the spectators. One of them stood in front of me and introduced himself as Jordan. Then he proceeded and told me everything about myself. It felt as if he had done my background check before our meeting. You came to this party to network, am I right, Dr. Philip? Well, here's the deal. We could guarantee that your hospital will get more patients than ever, but in exchange, you will need to give us one of your children. The shock on my face must have spoken for itself, but Jordan immediately continued. No, no, doctor, not in the physical sense. We will not take away your child from you. We just need you to promise your kid's soul to us. Although now that I think about it, I understand how ridiculous it was of me to even consider such an offer. But at that moment, I kid you not, all I could see was how well my hospital would do if I made this deal. More patients meant more money, which indirectly meant better vacations for my family. Sure, Jordan. You can have my daughter, Laya. All right, Dr. Philip. Consider the job done and Jordan left as fast as he had come. And after a few minutes, all the masked men had gone and the party continued as usual. That night when I came home, my wife was in my daughter's room nursing her. Apparently, Laya had woken up, screaming and burning up. She had a temperature, and my wife was waiting for me to return. I quickly medicated her, and soon she was okay. Or so we thought. The night terrors continue to this day, and they're getting worse. Elias' health was deteriorating. She wasn't doing good in school or personally. She said that there were monsters in her dreams that wouldn't let her sleep and would just torment her during the day, too. I was losing my kid before my own eyes. And deep down, I knew the reason. I just refused to admit it. I was trying to rationalize her behavior by taking her to psychiatrists. But nothing seemed to work. And one night, everything crossed its limit when Laya woke up screaming as usual. But this time, she had claw marks on her back which were so deep that I could see her raw flesh exposed. That's when I confided in my wife and told her why this was happening and all that happened at the party. She's a religious woman and contacted the church the next day. A priest named Father Ivan came to meet Laya and he soon confirmed my suspicion that someone had done some kind of black magic on my daughter. I ended up telling him about the party, too. He blessed Laya, which made her feel better for a few days, but not for long. Finally, Father Ivan performed a cleansing ceremony on my daughter, which was as good as baptizing her once again, introducing her to the faith again. This seemed to free Laya from the clutch of whatever evil had taken control of her. However, Father Ivan suggested we leave the country for good as he suspected that whoever had done this to my daughter would return to collect his payment. I sold my hospital and our house, and we moved to Spain. In the end, I had to abandon the hospital I did all this for in order to save my family. Now we live in a Spanish village where I work as a healer. We are away from all the money and the prosperity of the city, and especially away from the internet and the dark web. The first thing I remember is waking up in a bed at the hospital I work in, and the face of that beautiful woman. One of my colleagues, a fellow doctor who worked with me, was staring down at me besides the bed I was lying in. Along with him, there was a senior doctor and four to five nurses doing the same. They all looked concerned and confused. Are you okay, Harry? The senior doctor asked me. Yeah, I replied and at that moment I realized that my head hurt like someone was piercing a stake through it. The doctor made sure I was all right, prescribed some meds to me, and left. And so did the group of worried nurses. But my friend George stood beside my bed, still worried and more confused than ever. When everyone walked far enough, he asked me, What happened, man? You tell me. For how long have I been in this bed? I asked. And when I looked down at myself, I realized that I had been changed into the patient's dress. Two days. I've been waiting beside your bed for two days, begging God to get you out of the coma. Coma? What coma? Buddy, 
You were in a coma for two days, and the dean wasn't sure you would wake up. It was truly shocking to find one of our own staff members in our own hospital bed in such bad shape. I sighed, too tired to talk all of a sudden. Do you remember anything? To be honest, all I remembered was her face. But I wasn't about to tell George that, so instead I asked, What happened to me? As usual, you took the last shift on Friday. Nurse Catherine was there with you on your night rounds, but before visiting your last patient, you took a break according to her. And the next thing we all know, you were found unconscious in the lift on Saturday morning by the liftman. When he narrated the incident to me, some of my missing memories hit me like a train wreck. I still don't remember much. I lied to George, even though now I could remember what truly led me to this hospital bed, but I was still not ready to tell it to my friend. Partly because what happened was so bizarre that no one, not even George, would believe me. I decided to drink some water and sleep for a while as the headache was killing me. But I don't mind telling you guys what happened because I believe some of you will believe me. So as George said, I was on my night rounds, which I had done for the past six months since I joined this hospital as a doctor. I loved the night shift as I got the whole day to myself and I really didn't mind the quiet of the night. Most of the staff was friendly and a senior nurse, Catherine, always accompanied me on my rounds each night. But that day, unlike any other time, I had this urge to take a break before seeing my last patient for the night. And when I say break, I mean a smoke. Now I know, I know, I'm a doctor and I shouldn't smoke and all, but smoking is my only guilty pleasure and, to be honest, I never regretted it until that night. The hospital had a no-smoking policy that everyone had to follow, and even in the staff rooms, we weren't allowed to smoke, so the best place in the hospital premises to smoke was the cemetery. Yes, the hospital had a special cemetery to bury the bodies which were donated to the hospital. It was located at the far end of the property, and hardly anyone ever went there. The lift in the west wing of the hospital opened directly in front of the cemetery gates, and as I mentioned earlier, no one ever goes there, and definitely not at night. So I was sure that no one would catch me smoking. I entered the cemetery and sat on a bench, lit my cigarette, and just sat there, staring at the stars in the night sky. After a couple of minutes, I heard the crying. Soft sobs of a woman, possibly young, were coming from the far side of the cemetery. Now, you may think this is how every horror movie ever starts, but I didn't think much of it, as I'd been visiting the cemetery for the past six months at night, and I'd never had any abnormal or paranormal experiences. I threw my cigarette on the ground, stamped it out, and walked towards the cries. In front of me was a beautiful young girl, must have been in her 20s, crying in front of a grave. It was dark for me to see whose grave it was, but honestly, I didn't care. All I cared about was the crying girl in front of me. Are you okay? Honestly, no. Hmm. The girl seemed awfully honest. She died, and no one even cared. They gave her body to science, not even bothered to honor her with a proper burial. What's your name? I asked. The girl wiped her eyes, stood up offered me a stunning smile through her teary eyes. Philomena Darcy, she said. Nice to meet you, Philomena. I'm Harry. I'm a doctor here. I figured, she said, pointing at my blue scrubs, the white coat and the stethoscope hanging on my neck. So, you like coming to cemeteries at night? She asked. I could ask you the same. Well, there is no right time to grieve, is there? I guess not. Aren't you scared? I asked. Scared of what? I've lost the most precious thing to me. I believe that monsters are in the living world and not amongst the dead, so... No, I'm not scared. I was impressed by her answer, and I wanted to talk to her more. Would you like to have a coffee in the canteen? Looks like you could use one. Sure, she said and smiled again. I led the way, and we both walked towards the elevator I used to get there. As we waited for the elevator, we started speaking. Philomena turned out to be an interesting person. She stepped into the elevator, and I stepped in after her. In the distance, I could hear a cane, as if someone old was walking towards us. 
Then I saw it. An old man wearing a hospital gown was walking towards us using a wooden cane. At that moment, I panicked and started pressing the button in the elevator that closes its doors. Philomena sensed my panic and asked me what it was. I was almost out of breath and heaving by the time the elevator was on the first floor. The man, the old man, had a red ribbon tied to his hand. In this hospital, only the bodies who are dead have a red ribbon on their wrist, indicating they are dead. The fact that he had a ribbon meant he was dead and... He was approaching our elevator. After listening to me, Philomena was awfully silent. I looked at her face, which was dead serious, deprived of any tears or smiles. She raised her wrist and spoke. Do you mean a ribbon like this? She had a red ribbon identical to the old man in her hand. I was crying at my own grave, doctor. The next thing I know, everything was going black. That night in the cemetery, I saw not one, but two ghosts, which led me to this hospital bed. Now, when I join my work crew again, I swear to God, I'm never, ever going to take a break to smoke. We all probably hear the phrase, I don't eat meat, more than 20 times a week. We hear it when entering a restaurant. We hear it when ordering food, and we also hear it in our daily conversations. And while I thought I'd never utter those words, an incident that happened a few years ago made me swear to never eat meat again. This gruesome story details my horrific experience and explains why I don't eat meat. i had just come home from college. It was the summer break, and coming home was always great because I got to see my childhood friends. Tommy was like my best friend, as we'd known each other since childhood. He was a bit shy and reserved, while I was outgoing and social. But even with our different personalities, we were like brothers. Every summer there was an organized get-together where all our childhood friends would meet up and catch up with each other. Tommy didn't like going to these things, but I always forced him to. When we got there, we mingled, ate, and caught up with most of our other childhood friends. Towards the end of the program, a man walked up to us, and I recognized him. It was Alexander Anderson. He was an eccentric foodie who was obsessed with finding new tastes. He was also a hugely popular YouTuber. His channel featured various food-related topics like ASMR, mukbangs, and new cuisines, basically everything that had to do with food. While he was one of our childhood friends, we weren't really close to him, as Alexander was a little weird as a kid. Jake! Tommy! It's so good to see you, Alexander said as he pulled us in for a hug. You both smell so good. Now, this was a weird statement as Tommy and I weren't wearing any cologne, but I brushed it off as I thought it was just one of his pleasantries. So I said, it's nice to see you, Alexander. He then asked, did you enjoy the food? Tommy responded with, it was great. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Seeing as I made the whole thing, he said. Well, you did a good job. I also thought it was lovely. I replied. He smiled and said, Now, I'm about to film a new mukbang video for my YouTube channel, and I would love it if you two would participate in it. Now, I wasn't really much of a food enthusiast, and neither was Tom, but I didn't want to be rude, so I gladly agreed and told him we'd be in his YouTube video. Alexander then said, Great. I'll send you my address details, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Before walking away, Tommy wasn't too happy about this. You shouldn't have done that, Jake. You know I don't like going to things like that. Don't worry, I replied. I'm sure it'll be a fun experience. Little did I know that it'd be an experience I would never forget. It was finally Wednesday, and we were driving to Alexander's house. Tommy was feeling really anxious, and he said to me, I don't know about this, Jake. I'm having a really odd feeling about this. We both know how weird Alexander is. I assumed it was just Tommy's introvert nature acting up, so I calmed him down, saying, Come on, dude. I knew he was a bit weird when he was a kid, but he's a man now. Tommy replied, I know he is, but he's still weird. Didn't you notice how he looked at us at the get-together? He had this creepy smile on. 
Plus, he said we smelt good. Both of us know we weren't wearing any cologne. Something just seems off about this. I figured all this was probably just Tommy being in his head, so I said, I really didn't notice any of that, but it's probably all in your head, man. We'll be fine. We eventually arrived at Alexander's house, and the first thing I noticed was how huge it was. I knew being a YouTuber paid well, but I didn't realize it paid this well. We knocked on the door, and Alex quickly rushed to open it. He looked ecstatic, and the look he gave us was more craving than happy. He eventually spoke. Come in, come in, he said. We walked in and stood in the hallway. You gentlemen smell divine, he said. This time I was wearing cologne, which made it less odd, but there was something eerie about the way he said it. Thank you, I replied. Tommy clearly wasn't comfortable hearing Alex say that again, but he smiled and nodded. Wait here while I get the cameras ready, Alex said before walking away. We sat down on the seats in the hallway, and the more I sat there, the more I began to feel as anxious as Tommy. I would remind myself that I'm an adult at intervals, and I needed to stop being immature. The silence in the mansion was eerie and creepy. What the fuck is that? Tommy said, breaking the silence. I turned to see him looking at a painting on the wall. The painting seemed to consist of various human figures, eating a small child. Are they eating her? Tommy said, visibly disturbed. I knew at first glance. That was exactly what was happening, but decided not to freak Tommy out, so I said, It looks like it, but I'm not sure. It's such a bizarre painting. That's when we heard Alexander's voice from the end of the hall. Beautiful, isn't it? I found it in an art gallery. The painter said it was inspired by an old tribe who always felt incomplete, so in order to find completion, they took from another. Tommy responded with, What does that even mean? Alexander smiled and said, Only people of true art can understand it. Well, I think it's a fucking weird painting and you should get your money back. I could see Tommy was annoyed now and I decided I should probably step in, but before I could say anything, Alexander continued with, Well, it cost me $20,000 and I don't regret spending that amount because it was well worth it. You may not see the beauty now, my dear Tommy, but with time... You will. Tommy was about to say something, but Alexander quickly cut him off. <laughs> the cameras are ready, and I'd like us to begin shooting the video. Tommy wasn't happy, but he said, Fine, let's get it over with. As we walked down to the kitchen, I could tell Tommy was mad at me, as I was the one who dragged him into this, and it showed. I too was feeling extremely anxious, but Alex seemed completely oblivious to all this, as he still had a huge smile on his face. I knew Alex was always a weird dude, but this was getting a bit too much, and just as I thought things couldn't get any worse, he showed us what we would be eating. At first glance, you'd know it was meat, but the question was, what kind? It didn't look like pork, beef, or chicken, and it didn't smell like any of them either. I looked at Tommy and knew he was thinking the exact same thing, but before Tommy said anything, I asked Alexander, What kind of meat is this? Because it doesn't look like anything I've had. Is it mutton? He looked at us and said, Well, if I told you, it would defeat the point of the mukbang video. You don't have to know what it is. Just know it's delicious. He then told us to sit down because he was about to start the video but my mind had already started flying to numerous places. I wasn't even paying attention to what Alexander was saying in the introduction as I began to ask myself if Tommy was right all along. Have I been too nice? I was about to say something when Alex finally said to the camera, Now, my childhood friends and I are going to try out this mystery meat. He handed us a portion and despite my lack of enthusiasm to eat whatever it was, I decided to get it over with and leave. As Alex started eating, Tommy and I put the mystery meat in our mouths, and as soon as it touched my tongue, it was as if all my worries went away. There are no words to describe how delicious this mystery meat tasted. I instinctively went for another, and so did Tommy. Alex began to laugh as he said to the camera, <laughs> Looks like they like it. 
I ate to my fill that day, and just like that, all the anxiousness, creepiness, and weirdness went away. After the video was finished, we all hung out and had a great afternoon. Turns out, there was more to Alex than just food. He was also into gaming, music, and movies. And we talked and bonded for the rest of the afternoon. I had just heaved a sigh of relief, as I had become comfortable, and Tommy had too. And I thought to myself, I'm so glad we came. As we sat there talking, Tommy eventually said, But really, man, that mystery meat was delicious. What is it? Really? Alex said the meat was imported, but he was sure it was just a combination of assorted meat as he tasted a hint of chicken. As he continued talking, I felt the need to pee, so I asked Alex for his bathroom, and he said it was down the hall to the left. After using the bathroom, I started to go back to the living room, but I felt really thirsty as I had eaten a lot of meat, so I went to the kitchen, opened the fridge, and took out some water to drink. As I was drinking the water, I began to notice something out the corner of my eye. Was that a... I screamed before I could finish the thought. Right there in Alex's fridge was what seemed to be the hand of a human child. And the more I looked, the worse it got. Behind the groceries were more human parts. Feet, arms, fingers. And right then and there my brain put everything together. I threw up immediately, and I began to scream again. That's when I heard Tommy call out to me. Jake, are you okay? I didn't hear him finish the sentence. All I heard was a thumping sound like something fell, followed by silence. It didn't take long before Alex was standing in the kitchen, holding a metal pipe. The end of the pipe had something red on it that I figured was blood. He stood, looking at me in silence with a smile on his face for about two minutes before saying, I see you found your favorite dish. I wanted to say something, but ended up throwing up again, and before I could raise my head, I felt the hard metal pipe hit it, and I blacked out. I began to slowly open my eyes, and the first thing I saw were bright, flashing lights. It took a while before my vision focused, and I could finally see my surroundings. I was in what seemed to be a basement. I was also tied down to what seemed to be a hard concrete rock. The rock had red liquid stains all over it, and it reminded me of a butcher's slab. To my right I saw Tommy. He was unconscious, and he too was also tied down to something similar. I could hear Alex's voice saying, What's up, my fellow eccentric foodies? Now that you've all watched the preliminary video, this is where the real fun starts, and I do this only for you, my premium fans. I could finally see him, and he was standing in front of a camera. He was wearing an apron and lights were staged all around us. I was feeling a bit woozy after the blow to my head, but I blurted out the first thing that came to my mind. Alex, you sick freak! He then slowly turned to look at me and had this sick smile on his face. Look, guys, our meal is awake, he said while staring at the camera. What do you want from us? I screamed. He slowly looked at me and said, What do we want? We want what it is you've failed to appreciate all these years, the divine food that has been you all this while. He walked up to me and buried his nose in my chest. You smell so good, so tasty. Your sweat is doing a really good job of seasoning you up. As he said those words again, the realization hit me. So that's what you meant by that? I asked. He didn't respond. He just walked to the camera and said, That's enough chatter with the food. He walked over to get what looked like a toolkit from a shelf and started bringing out all sorts of sharp butcher knives. He then looked at the camera and spoke as if he was on a cooking show talking to an audience. Now, when the meat is fresh like this, there are some parts that are only delicious when eaten raw. He then walked up to Tommy with the knife in his hand. He lifted Tommy's head and held on to Tommy's ear. And with a clean cut, he took Tommy's ear off. My stomach churned and I felt like throwing up again. I'm guessing the pain woke Tommy up because he immediately started screaming. And Alex, with no hesitation, put Tommy's bloody ear into his mouth like... It was a cracker. I looked at him with disgust as I began to shout. 
You sick freak! Don't you dare touch my friend! He looked at me and said, Don't look at me like that. We both know that you love the taste. I saw your eyes as you gobbled down that meat. You had tasted something divine, and after that, you never go back. Don't you see, Jake? We are all walking cuisines. Children, teens, adults, each of us has our different flavor. And I have to taste them all. Tommy was screaming and began to cry. I looked at Alex as he continued ranting all of his nonsense, but all that was going through my mind was, I have to get out of here, and I have to take Tommy with me. Because a part of me knew this was all my fault. If only I had listened to Tommy, he wouldn't be in this mess. I began to profusely pull at my constraints. My wrist and ankles hurt, but I didn't care. As I did this, I watched him walk over to Tommy's feet, and while looking at the camera, he said, Another wonderful part to eat raw is the toes. Mmm, the taste is wonderful. And with no hesitation, I watched him bite off two of my friend's toes. He looked like an animal. Blood was all over his face as he said to the camera, Now, when eating the toes raw, you suck and nibble. You don't bite so as to avoid biting down on the bone. Tommy was screaming uncontrollably now, and I could only imagine the pain he was going through. I kept pulling on my constraints till my hands and feet felt like they were about to pop. What Alex did next is something that I still see every time I close my eyes. He walked up to Tommy and said, Now, you don't want your food to be struggling when cutting off the good parts, so it's best for them to bleed out. A clean, thin cut across the neck should do. Now, not too deep. He paused and continued with, We've got some good stuff in there. He looked at me, and with that, he carefully slit Tommy's throat open. Blood gurgled out Tommy's neck and down his chest. Oh, he's so messy, Alex said, cleaning the knife on his apron and walking away. As I watched Tommy bleed out, I began to scream. Tom, Tommy, hold on, man. I'm going to get you out of here. Alex, who was completely unfazed by everything that was going on, just kept on talking to the camera. Now, we have to get the preserving oil, as we need to keep the meat in pristine condition. I'll be right back. He walked up the stairs, and with that, he was gone. As I watched Tommy bleed out and slowly stop moving, I began to cry. Don't worry, man. I'm gonna get you out of here. I'm gonna fix this. I said in tears. Then, Tommy began to speak. It was obvious it was hard for him to do, but he did anyway. It's all right, Jake, he said to me in a really low voice. None of this is your fault. Now you make sure to get out of here. You're my brother, man, and I loved you. Silence followed, and he stopped moving. I could see his blood all over his body, and I began to call out his name. I didn't want to believe it, but... I knew he was dead. As I cried, I began pulling harder at my constraints, till I felt my wrist snap. The pain was unimaginable, but I was free. As I walked up to Tommy's body and began to sob, I saw the metal pipe on the floor and picked it up. I began to hear footsteps, so I waited at the base of the steps. I'm back, guys, I heard him say. Hopefully the meat has bled out. And without hesitation... I struck him hard on his face, and he fell to the floor. I noticed he was still breathing, and even though he was unconscious, I wanted to kill him so badly. But I didn't. I told myself he already ruined my life by killing my best friend, and killing him would just ruin my life even more. So instead of beating him to death, I went upstairs to call the cops. After that, I came back down to the basement. I walked up to Tommy's body and I cried my heart out. The weeks that followed seemed like a fast blur. I was called by the cops for questioning and I told them everything I knew. They told me I was lucky to be alive because no one out of the 30 victims they found had ever escaped Alex. 
They also told me that he was running a secret streaming channel for his premium subscribers on the deep web, which explains why he was filming us, and over a thousand users were found. I was alarmed at this because it just meant there are a thousand people out there who are as sick as Alex. The families of the victims were informed and they all demanded justice. But Alexander pled insanity, so he was taken to a high-profile state mental hospital. Tommy's parents were pained by this, and I heard the other victim's family were appealing the case so that he could get a life sentence or even the death penalty. I hoped it worked out for them, because that man truly deserved to die by the hands of justice. We buried Tommy during that week and I said my final goodbyes to my best friend. It's been five years since this incident, and instead of letting it break me down mentally, I pushed on with my life. I'm married now, and I have a two-year-old daughter. I still go to therapy regularly, but it doesn't really help, because every time I close my eyes, I find myself back there. And while I don't eat meat, sometimes I get this irresistible urge to do so. Sometimes I find myself looking at my kid daughter. I'd be salivating and wondering how she tastes. Sometimes I'd look at my wife in the same way, too. I regularly get thoughts to cut my own arm off and cook it, just to get that taste. But I use all the strength in my body to overcome these morbid thoughts, because I love my family. No matter how hard it gets, I will move on. Alexander Anderson may have been a sick freak, but he didn't lie when he said, Once you've tasted something divine, you can never go back. In the past, the average human consumed about two cups of coffee every week, but in recent times, the importance of coffee to individuals has greatly increased, and now the average human drinks about 400 milligrams of coffee every week, in other words, four cups a day. The question always being, why did coffee suddenly become so addictive? My name is Jeremy Cole, and contrary to the norm, I barely drink coffee. While I know that may seem weird to most people, I personally never felt the need to have a cup of coffee every morning before going on with my day-to-day -day activities. Although once in a while when I felt like having some, I would stop by Dunkin' on the way to work and get an iced coffee and some donuts, as it was the closest coffee place to our apartment. I had two roommates at the time, one of which was my best friend Henry and the other my girlfriend Madeline. We'd all been in each other's lives for almost five years, but unlike me, they swear by their coffee and can barely go a day without some. One afternoon on our way back from work, Henry noticed something that immediately had him grinning. It was a new Starbucks they had been constructing for the past few months, right across the street, and it was finally open. He and Madeline had been anticipating this for weeks, as Starbucks apparently had the best coffee out there, and this meant they no longer had to walk all the way to Dunkin's. It didn't take long for them to start their Starbucks experience, as the very next day, Henry walked in with three coffees and said, Hey guys, you'd never believe this. Apparently the first cup you buy is free. He handed one to Madeline, and she replied, What's the catch? <laughs> Nothing just that I taste it and give them my review. He stopped to take another sip before saying, Best coffee I've ever tasted. Madeline drank it and immediately had a smile on her face. I agree, she said. Henry handed me the spare one and said, Come on, man, it's Starbucks, not that Dunkin' shit. I laughed and responded with, We need to get to work, man. Henry and I worked at a gym downtown. I worked the register and Henry was a gym instructor. He seemed oddly energetic that day and I figured it was probably because he had two cups of coffee that morning and didn't think much of it. As the days went by, I began to notice a sluggishness around my roommates. They were barely sleeping and would black out mid-conversations. Soon enough, they began developing bags at the base of their eyes and seemed to be losing weight as each day went by. This affected Henry the most as his job required him to be fit if he was going to help anyone exercise. I eventually decided to ask them if they were using any drugs as that was the only explanation that could come to mind. The next morning, I called them both to the couch and said, Um, guys, is everything alright? They didn't respond 
and silence filled the room as they both seemed to be staring at something behind me with an obvious look of concern and fear on their faces. I immediately looked back to see what was so distracting, but there was absolutely nothing in the room that hadn't been there for months. At this point, it didn't take a psychologist to know something was clearly wrong with them. So I said, Henry, Madeline, are you guys okay? Their attention shifted to me. They had a visible look of confusion on their faces. Madeline then said, What do you mean? As she pulled out a piece of her hair, I mean, you guys have been acting very strange and I'm worried about you both, I replied. Now, they didn't say anything at first. They simply looked at each other for a minute. Then Henry stood and said, We're okay, man. We've actually been talking about how lately we've been happier than ever. As he spoke, I couldn't help but notice more strange things. His eyes looked empty, and although he was smiling, his face was expressionless. I couldn't help but wonder when exactly he started looking so empty. Madeline was standing now and had come over to where I was. She hugged me and rested her head on my chest, and I couldn't help noticing something about her too. She had bald spots all over her head. I had noticed lately how she would pull out her hair at random intervals, but I didn't think it was this bad. When she stepped back from the hug, I realized her eyes also seemed empty, and just like Henry, she seemed helpless and expressionless. Now, at this point, my mind had started racing to try to figure out what was happening to my roommates. Eventually, I noticed we were running late for work, so I told Henry we should probably get going. He said I'd have to wait for him downstairs, as he had to get their coffee first. Both he and Madeline now got two cups of coffee every morning before heading out, and two cups when they got back. That day, Henry seemed super sluggish and phased out. I figured it was due to the fact it was a Monday and very busy. This usually didn't affect me as people didn't need me as much as him in the gym. As I stood at my workstation, I couldn't help but go back to this morning. There was something definitely wrong with my roommates. The question was, what? I decided to think back when they started acting weird, but my thoughts were interrupted by a scream followed by people running out of the gym. I immediately ran to see what was going on, but the horrific sight I was met with wasn't what I expected to see. Henry was standing over on the other side of the gym with some employees. His head was in his hands, and I could tell he was crying. That's when I saw it. A guy was lying on the bench press with his neck snapped back. His eyes were open, but had rolled to the back of his head, and the hundred kilogram weights that killed him laid on the floor behind his head. My stomach churned at the sight and I couldn't help but walk back to my station. The cops and paramedics showed up in about 10 minutes and it was stated the man died on impact. Henry was responsible for spotting the dead man, so the cops called him aside to ask a few questions. Henry was visibly shaking throughout the interrogation and after some time, the cops came over to ask me and the manager some questions. Now, most of the time, this would be flagged as irresponsibility on the part of the gym and the individual. Worst case scenario, he would be shut down for a couple months and have to make some improvements to assure us the safety standards have improved. The officer paused and looked back at Henry as if he had disappointing news. Unfortunately, this isn't one of those scenarios as we have cause to believe your employee was under the influence while working here and was partly responsible for the death of the young man. Our manager didn't seem at all phased by what the officer just said, and I realized I wasn't the only one with the suspicion that Henry was using drugs. The officer continued with, Now, we were informed that you're his roommate. Do you know if Henry had been using any drugs or drinking before coming in today? I responded with, No, officer. As far as I know, he doesn't use any drugs, and all he had to drink this morning was Starbucks. As soon as I said the words, the realization hit me. The officer gave me his card and informed me to give him my address as they would come by later with a warrant to check for drugs as Henry showed all the signs of being intoxicated. He also informed Henry he would have to take a drug test and be brought in for questioning. I raced home to check on Madeline, 
as I still hadn't figured out how Starbucks was responsible for their strange behavior. But before anything else, I didn't want her to hurt herself or anyone else. I got home to see Madeline on the bed pulling out her hair and humming. She stared at the ground. She didn't react to me walking into the room as she continued staring at the floor. I walked over to the bed and sat beside her. Hey, sweetie, are you okay? I said. She looked over at me and nodded before looking back at the ground. Madeline, what are you looking at? I asked, trying to get her attention. She didn't look at me, but she replied. The pretty lady. Her strange demeanor was frightening in a way, and I found myself looking for the woman she was talking about. What lady? I said. Madeline still didn't look up as she replied. Can't you see her? The lady with the long hair and star crown? She's been here for a while now. Everything about how serious she was frightened me. I was scared for her, and I was scared for Henry, too. I knew telling the cops Starbucks was responsible for my friend's behavior would be unbelievable, and I had to somehow get proof that I was crazy. I got up slowly from the bed and said, Hey, I'm going to head out for a while. Don't go anywhere, all right? Almost immediately, she looked at me with a disturbed face and said, The lady says you shouldn't do anything dumb, Jeremy. Now, I didn't know what she meant by this or what she assumed I'd be doing, but I decided not to think too much of it as she clearly wasn't in the right state of mind. I locked the door and took her keys so she wouldn't be able to get out until I came back with help. I walked across the street to the Starbucks, and right before walking in, something caught my eye. Their logo was a lady with long hair and a crown. At this point, I wasn't too sure if walking in there was such a good idea, but I mustered up the courage and stepped in. At first glance, the store had nothing eerie about it, but as I looked around, I realized I was horribly wrong. All the customers seemed to be in the exact same condition as Henry and Madeline. Most of them had chunks of hair missing, and they were talking to the tables and floor, but the most noticeable similarity they had to my roommates was the empty and hopeless looks in their eyes. I walked up to the register and realized their employees looked nothing like the customers. They looked perfect and healthy, and didn't seem to be seeing things. I guess I was lost in thought as the guy at the register spoke. Good afternoon. What's your order, please? He said. Just give me an iced coffee, I replied. He nodded as he headed over to get my drink. He returned shortly with my coffee and handed it to me. I got out my wallet to pay and he said, It's complimentary. This seemed odd to me, so I asked, Why? What's the catch? He laughed before replying with, It's your first time at Starbucks, sir, so it's complimentary. But we actually request you drink it and give a review before heading out. I tried not to act weird as I had no intention of ever drinking this. Well, I'm sorry about that. I'd much rather pay and send in a review later. It was clear he wasn't too happy about what I had just said, as his nice and friendly demeanor quickly changed. I'm sorry, sir, but that's not policy. If there's a problem, you can kindly return your drink and leave. I stared at the drink and pondered my options. I decided a sip would probably not have any effect on me, as I wasn't going to drink any more of it, ever again. So I drank it. What I expected to taste wasn't at all what I tasted. It tasted heavenly, like something I had never tasted before. I resisted the urge to keep drinking, as I didn't want to end up like the rest of the people here. I looked at the man at the register and said, it's good. He didn't look happy as if what I had just said wasn't satisfactory enough for him. He simply smiled and replied, Well, just come back next time. Remember, it's more than just coffee. It's coffee that inspires. It's Starbucks. I walked out of the store and immediately called the officer to inform him I found what Henry took. He told me they were almost at my apartment as he had something important to question me about. I walked upstairs to check on Madeline, and as I unlocked the door, she still sat in the same spot staring at the floor. 
She immediately looked up at the coffee I was holding and said, Can I have some of that? I looked at her and instantly felt horrible. She didn't seem like the same person I fell in love with. I replied, No, sweetie. You can't have this, but help is on the way. I was crying now as I held her hands. She looked at me and took a piece of her hair out. Come on, <laughs> just a little, <laughs> she said. She was visibly upset now and tried snatching it from me. I didn't know what to do and was worried she'd become violent, so I decided to go back downstairs and check if the cops had arrived. Luckily, they had. The officer had a worried look on his face, so I said, Is there something wrong, officer? He responded with, The drug test was carried out on Henry, and it's something we've never seen before. We're hoping you can give us a sample, and we can find out exactly what it is. I was worried about the cops not knowing exactly what drug it was, as I had hoped it wouldn't be something that bad. Of course, here's a sample. I said as I handed him the Starbucks coffee. Naturally, he looked at me like I was insane, so I continued with, You have to trust me, officer. I don't know how, but I know it has something to do with that drink. He stared at me for a while as if he was trying to figure out if I was joking with him or not. He eventually nodded and handed it to another cop. I hope you're right, he said. I hope so, too there's someone else upstairs that also needs help. I think she's on the same thing Henry's on, I replied. I explained the situation to them and they followed me upstairs. They explained I should probably talk to her first and explain the situation as their going in might startle her and lead to a violent reaction. I walked through the door and immediately felt a sharp pain sear through my back. I fell to the floor before turning to see Madeline standing over me, holding a knife. She looked completely insane now and had a crazy look in her eyes. Where is it? Where is it? She said, looking around me like I dropped something. I immediately screamed for the cops to come in and restrain her. She stepped away from me in the door, holding the knife towards the officer and said, What is this, Jeremy? Why are the cops here? She was obviously alarmed, so I replied, Calm down, Madeline. The officers are here to help you. The pain in my back was giving me a pounding headache, and I couldn't say anything without my head aching even more. Madeline looked at me and screamed. She told you not to do anything stupid, Jeremy. She paused and began looking all over the room, saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I guess at this point the officer had seen enough to know Madeline wasn't in the right state of mind, as he said. That's enough, ma'am. We're here to help. Please put down the knife and come with us. Madeline didn't seem phased by the officer. She looked at me and said, Please, babe, just one cup and I'll go with you. Just one cup, please. 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 She was screaming now, so the officer then spoke to his colleague, saying, Donald, unarm and restrain her. Proceed with caution. An officer who I figured was Donald started walking towards Madeline. Don't come near me, she said, stepping back. Calm down, ma'am, the officer replied, walking closer. She began muttering the words, Just one cup, just one. And as she said those words, she got a look on her face, like she had just realized something. She looked out the window and saw the Starbucks across the street. We all realized what she was about to do and rushed towards her. But she ran and jumped. The officers called in the paramedics and rushed outside to help her. I looked outside the window to see her in a pool of blood. Her legs were twisted the wrong way, but she was alive. She pulled herself up to crawl towards Starbucks for about three seconds before she died. There was something truly sickening with the sight of her disfigured body dragging itself towards Starbucks. My head was still pounding and I couldn't help but cry. I did nothing but cry. In the weeks that followed, it was discovered that the drugs being ingested by the Starbucks customers hadn't been seen anywhere prior to this case. The Starbucks across the street was shut down and all employees were imprisoned. 
The attempt to shut down the Starbucks franchise as a whole was futile and resulted in only the one being closed. Henry was put in rehab as he had inflicted harm on himself while in custody. It was reported that he had slammed his head on the cell repeatedly, and it hasn't been determined if he did this in an attempt to get the madly addictive drink or out of guilt for the man he had killed while under the influence. Sadly, there has been no progress with his case. All victims that were brought into custody claim to see the same beautiful woman with long hair and a star-headed crown. No explanation was given as to how they all saw the Starbucks logo speaking to them. It seemed all of them got addicted after their first sip. The employees refused to testify or give any statements about the drug or Starbucks, and the drug was soon termed the Starbucks Special. I'm currently standing outside Henry's rehab clinic. I came to visit him today, but lately he refused to see me. He didn't take Madeline's death well. My Uber should be arriving any time now. Oh, there it is. Ah, uh, good afternoon, sir. Where are you headed? Starbucks. The closest one that's open is downtown, sir. Is that a problem? I'm sorry, sir. I don't want to seem intrusive, but... Have you heard about their issues lately? I just want to make sure you're aware and safe. That's nice of you, sir, but I've had it before and I'm fine. All I need is just one cup. My name is Jason from Massachusetts. So me, my brother Damon, and his sister Janet, on his side, because me and him only share a father... We're out late night hanging with a few friends at this park, about ten minutes away from our grandparents' house. We would gather at the park and split up into teams to play a game of manhunt. The park was directly across from a small neighborhood with a majority of the houses really close to each other, almost connected. This neighborhood was near the water, so on the outer perimeter, it was closed off by a pond and forests. Our team was the first to hide, so the three of us decided to stick together. We decided to hide in the outer perimeter because no one dared to go near there considering there was a known group of creepy homeless people who were known for messing with kids our age and making disturbing and perverted remarks if you were a female. So as Damon and I found our spot, Janet decided to pick one away from us but relatively close as she feared she would give up our spot by accident. About five minutes after we secured our spot, Damon and I jerked our heads to what sounded like a female scream coming from where Janet had gone off to. Without hesitation, we quickly headed towards the noise. While on our way, she let out another scream, saying, uh, Get away from me, you freak! When we approached the origin of the noise, we saw this tall, slender, dirty-looking man standing over Janet with what appeared to be a steak knife. He had long, black and grayish hair that looked extremely greasy and poorly cared for. His skin was a yellowish color along with his eyes, which were also bloodshot. He probably had a drinking problem, but could care less because he had probably given up caring about his health. We guessed he probably popped out of nowhere and swung the knife and missed but startled Janet, causing her to fall back, considering she had no marks or scratches on her. My brother Damon then picked up a nearby rock that was probably not even close to the size of his palm since he grabbed the closest thing he could find. I, on the other hand, was next to a branch, which I threw as soon as Damon threw the rock, since the man wouldn't be able to dodge both. And as soon as the objects left our hand, we charged and tackled the man to the ground, knocking the knife out of his hands. We then restrained him and lifted him to his feet and allowed Janet to do the honors, which she was prepared to do, until a look of anger on her face turned to what seemed to be empathy for the man. Confused, I asked her, "'What are you waiting for?' Give him what he deserves. She then softly replied, Let him go. I'm sure he's learned his lesson. He's a nobody, just plain desperate. Forget about him. Damon, still fuming with anger, gut-checked the man with his left fist to his stomach, and we let go of him as his knees buckled and dropped to the ground. I then, for laughs, kicked him in the ass, sending him away. The man was shook up, but muttered in a groggy, evil voice, you wish you got rid of me, and took off into the woods. We sighed in relief and decided to get out of there. A few weeks later, there was a report on the news that a young girl around our age was found stabbed to death in that same area. 
the suspect, no other than the same man we encountered during our game of Manhunt. We assumed he thought Janet had come back, and he didn't want to fumble his opportunity again and made his move. We were all stunned to the point that we turned the report off and sat in silence for about ten minutes, only left to imagine the outcome if it actually was Janet. My name is Aaron, and if there's one thing you should know about me, it's that I hate winter. To tell you the truth, I don't even mind the cold, but when winter comes, I get so depressed and nervous that I can hardly sleep for the whole season. Similarly, there's another reason why I can't sleep. Every time I go to sleep, that spirit, something, stalks me and wants to kill me. I can't tell you when or how it all started. I just know that being 34 years old, it's a miracle that I'm alive. During each winter, that being is closer and closer to me. Closer to killing me. This winter started like any other. I started to feel the cold and it put me in a very bad mood. I lived alone in my house and since it was a family house in the south of the city, there were blocks and blocks of distance between my neighbors. I wanted to spend the first weekend of winter watching TV with the fireplace heating the whole room. But I couldn't even do that as the power went out as soon as it got dark. I went outside to check my generator and it was broken. I would have to fix it in the morning as we were in the middle of a heavy snowfall. I returned home, disappointed and angry. But all those feelings turned into pure terror and panic when I set foot in my dining room. In my house there were white footprints leading to the kitchen. But not just any footprints. They were the footprints of small bare feet. Feet that looked like woman's feet. Normally I would have been confused, but in the middle of winter in the middle of snowfall. I knew what this meant. The spirit that haunts me every winter, that appears in every snowfall, was haunting me again. I walked slowly towards the kitchen. Although there was no light, the fire in the fireplace illuminated the house a little. Anxiety got the better of me, and I stopped walking, ran desperately to the kitchen door, and closed it. With any luck, that spirit might stay in the kitchen and not try to kill me. Suddenly, I began to feel very cold in my body. A horrible headache began to take hold of me. It was as if I'd eaten ice, but much more intense. I ducked my head and grabbed it with everything I could, but when I opened my eyes, I noticed something new. The footprints were no longer leading toward the kitchen. They were heading in my direction and ended up in front of me. Aaron! <laughs> I fell down from fear, and when I looked back, there was no one there. I desperately ran aimlessly, terrified, until I ran into a corner of the room. I wanted to grab a knife from the kitchen, but it didn't make sense. Can you stab a ghost? A strange noise interrupted my thoughts. It was footsteps. Those footsteps started where they had scared me and walked slowly towards me. I could see the footsteps moving towards me again although there was no figure to accompany them. Nope, I'm not going to wait for you to catch me. I ran to the kitchen and opened the door. Maybe the knife was a bad idea, but I preferred that to not trying anything. What could I do? Go outside and let the snowfall kill me? I grabbed a huge knife and walked away from the kitchen since I could see absolutely nothing in it. As soon as I got back to the dining room, I looked around to check if I was alone. Everything was dark. I could only see the snow outside the house. The snowfall was getting heavier and heavier, but I would rather die there than here. Who knows what this terrifying being would do to me if it caught me. My fate might be even worse than dying. I decided to make one last run through the darkness towards the exit door, but halfway there I felt someone grab me by the hair and start dragging me through the house. Every time I wanted to recover and run towards the door, that thing threw me against the wall, away from it. Every time I got close to the exit, a huge headache would come over me, and the monster would grab me by the hair again and pull me away. And one of the last times it grabbed me, I tried to stick the knife into the horrible being, but with no result. Or rather, it had a result, but a negative one. The spirit became enraged at my attempt to attack it, and began to scratch my face with absolute violence. The blood began to run down my face, 
and I felt that every time I tried to defend myself, it only made her angrier. To finish her attack, she grabbed me by the hair and threw me violently against the glass of the exit, which broke as if it were paper. I was in a lot of pain, but this was my chance to escape. I ran through the snow, getting lost in it. Behind me, I heard a desperate scream. Aaron! My body felt cold. I couldn't breathe and I felt numb. I think I was dying. I was too cold. Every joint in my body was numb. I started to get very sleepy until I just fell asleep. I opened my eyes. I couldn't believe I was still alive. I wasn't cold. I was in a white t-shirt in a doctor's office waiting for a doctor. Suddenly, a man in a white coat walked in. Aaron. Aaron, it looks like you've had another episode. What do you mean? Who are you? It's a pity. All the progress we've made with you, we're going to lose it all at once. Progress? What are you talking about? Where am I? Aaron, I know everything you're going to tell me, so I'll be straight with you. There's no spirit chasing you. It's not winter. You've been in a mental institution for over 15 years, when you proved you couldn't live on your own, and you couldn't stay in the orphanage. Orphanage? Aaron, that woman you think is attacking you is your mother. You dealt with a lot of violence as a child. You tried to escape in the middle of a snowfall, and your mother grabbed you by the hair and locked you in your room. My head hurts. I don't want to think about this. Exactly, Aaron. Your brain refuses to remember that traumatic experience. But you have to in order to have a normal life. You're not in your mother's house. It's not winter, and it's not snowing. Nobody is going to hurt you. No. No. <laughs> My name is Aaron, and if there's one thing you should know about me, it's that I hate the winter. Back in the late 80s, my husband and I moved into a cabin in the woods. It was completely isolated, making it the perfect place to settle down and raise a family. I was also nine months pregnant at the time and looking forward to being a mother. I couldn't move around much due to my severe back pain, so most of my days were spent lying in bed. And if I ever needed to get somewhere, my husband would always have to help me out. One day, my husband had to work overtime at the local ranger station, leaving me home alone for the night. I was used to my husband working at night, to be honest, so that wasn't a problem for me. I kissed him goodbye, changed into my pajamas, and climbed into bed, then dozed off. At around midnight, I woke up to the sound of a vehicle pulling up on my driveway and two headlights shining through my window. I let out a yawn and rolled onto my side, then peered out the window next to my bed. What I saw was a rusty old pickup truck parked in front of my house and four men standing at my door. They were all dressed in black and staring right back at me through the window. One of them shouted, could you please open the door, ma'am? We know you're alone in there. My friends and I haven't had a bite to eat all day, and there's nothing more filling than a nice, juicy pregnant woman. He said, while hungrily licking his lips. I kept silent, trembling in fear of what I'd just heard. Who were these men? I'd never seen them before in my life, yet they knew I was pregnant and that I was alone. But more importantly, they wanted to eat me, including my unborn child. I needed to escape, but I wasn't in any condition to run. And even if I could run, where would I go? I lived in the woods, miles away from town, didn't have a landline, and my husband had the car. Also, it was 20 degrees outside. How far could I possibly get while wearing a nightgown and barefoot? One of the men started banging on the door violently, so I rolled out of bed and fell on the floor, landing flat on my butt. I wasn't exaggerating when I said I needed my husband to help me stand up. My back pain was so intense 
that I couldn't even get up, even if my life depended on it, and it most certainly did in this case. As embarrassing as it sounds, all I could do was crab walk across the floor, basically crawling on all fours in a belly up position. Using my hands and feet, I crab walked out of my room, went into the hallway, and headed straight for the basement, thinking it would be a good hiding spot. I couldn't sit up enough to reach the doorknob, but thankfully the basement door was slightly ajar. I kicked it open and crawled in as the man continued banging on the front door. Once I was inside the basement, I found myself sitting at the top of a long stairway, but I didn't feel like going further down. I just quietly closed the door behind me, letting it click shut, and then laid flat on my back. Even though it was only for a few seconds, crab walking with a big belly was exhausting, and lying down in a prone position gave me some relief. So, I just stayed like that, on the top step, breathing heavily while thinking of what to do next. That's when I heard movement at the base of the stairs, with wide, fear-filled eyes. I tilted my head up to look down at the last step, and to my absolute horror, three men were standing there, looking straight at me. I let out a blood-curdling scream when I saw them. I was so worried about the guy banging on the front door that I didn't realize the other men had already found a way inside. I sat up as best I could and raised my hands above my head, trying to reach the doorknob while maintaining eye contact with the men, but I couldn't reach it. The men must have figured out right away that I couldn't stand up or even sit up because they all started laughing at me. To them, I must have looked like a helpless turtle lying on its shell, unable to turn over. Look at all that fresh meat, one of them said while loudly licking his lips. Yeah, we're gonna eat like kings tonight, said another. I call first bite, said the third guy. That belly looks so plump and juicy, I just gotta sink my teeth into it. Hearing these men casually talk about eating me and my unborn child was terrifying beyond words. And if that wasn't creepy enough, the men started climbing the stairs on all fours, one after the other, like a pack of wolves. They were taking their sweet time doing so, salivating as I continued to reach for the doorknob, but it was no use. After a few seconds, I got tired and fell flat on my back yet again, with no weapons around to defend myself. I did the only thing I could think of. I raised both of my bare feet in the air and bent my knees back like I was getting ready to kick. If you come one step closer, I'll kick you in the face, I threatened. The men stopped for a moment and glanced at my feet, then back at me, and just started laughing. Of course they didn't take me seriously. A crying pregnant woman lying on her back with her bare feet raised in the air isn't very intimidating to begin with. That combined with the fact I was shaking from head to toe and looked like I was going to pee myself at any second just made me look even more non-threatening. Is this the part where we run away? One man asked in a mocking tone as he continued ascending the stairs. The last two women we killed had actual guns pointed at us. And you think we're gonna run away from two little bare feet? How amusing. Hearing that filled me with dread, but I kept the soles of my feet aimed in their direction, waiting for them to make a move. When the first man got close enough, I kicked him in the face as hard as I could, sending him rolling down the stairs. But the second man jumped over him and lunged toward me. I kicked again, but this time, he caught my foot mid-kick, then brought it up to his face. The man focused his gaze on my bare foot, then smiled at me. What a delicious looking foot you have, ma'am. So soft and slender. I could just eat it up, let you go. Why would we ever let you go? <laughs> and with that, he opened his mouth and licked the bottom of my foot from heel to toe. I glared at him in disgust and was about to kick him with my other foot, but the third man grabbed that one as well. Please, 
Just let me go. I promise I won't tell anyone. I bet. Let you go? Why would we ever let you go? <laughs> the man laughed as he kissed my foot. We're about to have dinner. Before I knew it, several hands were clawing at my nightgown, ripping it off my body in seconds. No, please! I sobbed as I was left in just my panties and bra. I'd never felt so humiliated and scared in my life. I felt my skin crawl as the men drooled over me, staring hungrily at my belly. They held my wrists and ankles down, so all I could do was struggle in vain. Gentlemen, dinner is now served, so let's eat. He said calmly, just when I thought I was going to die. I heard two gunshots outside, followed by my husband's voice calling my name. I'm in the basement! I shouted back as loud as I could. I could hear my husband's footsteps racing towards me, and so could the men, which is why they let me go and started running down the stairs. They knew my husband was armed, so they slipped out through the cellar door. When my husband entered the basement, he looked down at me with concern and helped me to my feet. I told him about the three men, and he chased after them, unfortunately. They made it back to their pickup truck and sped off. We never saw them again after that. But my husband did manage to shoot the one at the front door. Cops were called, but nothing ever came of it, and we moved on. I have since given birth to a healthy baby girl, and we're all still living peacefully in the cabin to this day, albeit with extra locks on our windows and doors. I still wake up at night having nightmares about the big yellow eyes, and the blood-stained mouth. Now, you must be wondering what I'm talking about. This happened exactly two years ago, when the worst blizzard of the decade hit our part of the state. All the news channels were broadcasting the news of this supposedly worst blizzard of the decades for days before it actually hit. And as a responsible father, I decided to call my daughter back home from her university, which was a couple of hours upstate. As I had expected her to arrive two days before the blizzard, I was not worried about anything. Our house was ready to face the ample snow and the strong wind. I had already stocked enough food in the pantry to last us a week or so. All I was worried about was my little girl getting back home from the university. On the day on which I had expected her to get back home, I got a call from her saying that she needed to stay back to complete a project with her friend Winnie, and that Winnie would be accompanying her back home. They would be leaving a day later and were looking forward to having fun indoors once they got back here. I knew Winnie as she was my daughter Sarah's friend from the university. She had been in my house a couple of times. Unfortunately for the girls, the blizzard hit a day early and now they were driving home on a snowy road with minimum visibility. I knew my daughter drove safely, but I was still worried as a dad. Moreover, because the road passed through a national park with no habitation for miles, I was expecting the ladies to arrive by afternoon, but as the clock ticked and there was no sign of them, I got worried by the passing minute. Soon it got dark outside, and all my calls were going to voicemail. I got worried as the blizzard was getting worse outside. It was around 7 in the evening and pitch blackout. My driveway had 3 inches of snow already, and somehow I had a gut feeling that something was terribly wrong with the girls. I decided to drive up the road which the girls had been taking to come back home and to see if their car had broken down anywhere. I also kept calling on their phones in the hopes of reaching out to them. After a few minutes on the road, I realized why authorities warned us to stay inside. This blizzard was an absolute disaster. I couldn't see five feet ahead on the road as it was fog due to snow. I was constantly trying to contact the girls and suddenly the call went through. It was Winnie's phone and I was praying to God that she would pick it up. I was barely managing to keep the car on the road. I was worried about how they were doing. Hello, Winnie, can you hear me? I I'm Drake, Sarah's dad. Where are you girls? I heard only silence coming from the other side, so I tried again. Hello, Winnie, can you hear me? Sarah, are you on the line? Still. 
All I could get was radio silence from their end. Luckily, an app on my phone allowed me to track the location of Winnie's phone, and to my utter surprise, they were way off track, somewhere on the mountain road away from the highway. I rushed my car through the blizzard to said location, and I saw my daughter's car a few yards ahead of me. Her headlights and back lights were on. The driver's side and passenger side doors were wide open, and as I got out of my car and approached hers, I quickly realized that there was no one in the car. But according to the app on my phone, Winnie's phone had to be in the car or at least somewhere nearby. I called her once more, and she answered the call. Winnie, where are you? I almost yelled on the phone as I knew that if her phone was nearby and the fact that someone was picking up the call, chances were it would be Winnie, and she could be here, somewhere. Again, I received no reply. Instead, I could hear heavy breathing, as if someone had run a half marathon non-stop and had finally reached the end. However, I couldn't see anything, due to the thick snowfall. I stood beside Sarah's car and searched it thoroughly. There was no phone in there. Not Sarah's, and not even Winnie's. That's when I heard the labored breathing that was coming from the other side of the phone earlier. I instinctively looked down beneath the car. I saw Winnie lying there, limp and breathing hard. Her eyes were dilated and as big as saucers, but when I called out her name, she didn't respond to me. Instead, she just kept on looking in front of her as if not even noticing me there. I tried to grab her hand to get her attention, but even that didn't faze her. It was as if she was in some kind of trance or if she had been hypnotized by someone. The snow was falling on my back as I was crouched beside the car trying to talk to Winnie. Instead of looking for Sarah, I decided to take care of Winnie first as I was sure she must be freezing down there without any sweater or a jacket. As soon as she was out in the open, the snow was falling all over her. Even then, she seemed as if she was frozen in time, unaware of her surroundings, just looking into the distance. I picked her up and ran towards my car. I put her in the back seat and wrapped the spare blanket around her. Now I needed to know what had happened, and more importantly, where was my daughter? I tried to talk to Winnie again. Hey Winnie, what happened? Where is Sarah? I patted her cheeks and tried to shake her lightly by the shoulders, but she wasn't responding to anything. That's when I heard the ear-piercing inhuman scream coming from the interior of the forest. The headlights of my car and my daughter's illuminated the tree line, but due to the snow, I wasn't able to see anything beyond that, and the scream had definitely come from deep in the forest. Fortunately, I had a flashlight and a small gun with me. I locked up my car with Winnie inside it and stalked towards the forest. The snow in there was knee-deep, but it was my little girl in danger, so it didn't matter. I walked into the forest for a good 15 minutes before I heard the scream again. It was closer this time. I pointed my gun straight ahead and kept walking. After a few yards, I heard someone eating something, as if someone was ripping flesh off an animal or something. My first instinct was to turn around, thinking that it must be some wild animal enjoying its meal or something. But when I looked through the bush, I saw the most terrifying thing. I saw two bright yellow eyes staring straight at me. I stood as still as a rock as the snow fell around me. It must have been a wolf, I thought. But soon the animal stood, and hanging from its mouth were the intestines of its prey. And amongst those intestines, I spotted a piece of a t-shirt that had the logo of my daughter's university. That's when I realized that the monster was eating my daughter. I froze there for a few seconds, 
unable to comprehend what I was seeing. My daughter was dead, and whatever had killed her wasn't a human, neither was it an animal. It was seven foot tall, humanoid with yellow eyes and razor sharp teeth. It had slim limbs with dark hair on it. Its face was like a human with a flat nose and long pointy ears. I had no idea what to make of it. So I shot it, and as the bullets hit it, I heard the same weird scream once again. As it started marching towards me, it dropped my daughter's remains. I knew in that situation all I could do was run and save the other girl in my car, and myself. My daughter had already died at the hands of this thing. I had to save her friend. I shot it again and ran from there, while it limped behind me because my bullet hit it in the leg. The last thing I remember seeing, besides the monster, was the detached head of my daughter beside her half-eaten body, with her eyes still wide open. We got away from there that night, and I took Winnie to a hospital, even though my own daughter was still being preyed on by some humanoid. The next day, when the blizzard slowed down, a big team of cops and forest rangers were looking for the remains of Sarah and the monster that took her. But all they found were some bones of my daughter, and no trace of the thing that killed her. Winnie was never able to talk or completely be normal after that incident. None of the authorities believe me, and everyone thinks it was an animal attack, probably a bear. And I'm stuck in my own hell, all alone, dreaming every night of the awful yellow eyes and the dead head of my kid. Do you guys believe me? Anyone who has a sibling will understand my story very well, especially if you and your sibling are inseparable. I'm Dalton, and I have a twin brother, Aiden. We are both eight, and our mother is pregnant with her third child, who I heard is going to be a girl. So Aiden and I are going to have a sister. I don't understand much about babies or how they get into mother's bellies, but I do know one thing, that my sister is going to come out of mom next month. As the days pass by and the date on which the doctor said my baby sister will come into the world comes closer, my parents become more and more worried. Although the doctor had assured them a hundred times that my sister will be okay, they can't stop contemplating the possibility that, that something will go wrong. My dad had a business and you could say we're rich. I know this because other boys in my school don't come to school in a black car with the four interconnected rings logo on it. Only I do. They all help me with my homework, and all the teachers are nice to me, even though I'm not so bright in my studies. They say that it must be tough at home for me, so they don't mind helping me as much as they can. It's nice to be treated better than my classmates. At home, my mom is always worried about my baby sister and how she needs to take care of herself till my sister comes out of her. She barely pays me any attention. She wants this daughter of hers to be perfect, even though I'm pretty perfect myself. I don't understand why she needs another baby to be perfect too. Mostly at home, dad goes to work, mom is in her room napping, reading, or doing whatever pregnant moms do, and I'm all alone. There's Mrs. Lee, my caretaker, who makes sure I do my homework and eat food on time, but I don't like her very much, and she keeps on following me everywhere. Dad comes back home late, almost always after I'm asleep. And whenever he is at home, he's either fussing over my mom and my future baby sister, or fighting with my mom over something. He barely looks at me, let alone has time for me. My parents think I'm old enough to look after myself with the help of Mrs. Lee. Now, you must be thinking why I'm alone and bored when I have a twin brother. Well, Aiden lives somewhere else. Every other week, Dad and I go visit him there. Mom doesn't want to see him especially not when she's about to give birth to our baby sister. He's been living apart from us for the last three years, since we were five. I get so bored alone, and whenever we go see him, he refuses to talk to me, let alone play with me. Dad wants me to have a good bond with my brother, and so do I. So, every time I go to visit him, I ask Dad to buy me new toys so I can share them with him while we play. He always wants to talk to Dad alone, without me. 
Dad always goes into his room while I wait outside, and every time he walks out, he's disappointed. I hate to see Dad like that. He's so tired, working, looking after Mom, and then visiting Aiden, too. That's why each time he comes out of Aiden's room, I beg him to bring Aiden home with us, give him one more chance. At first, Dad used to listen to my pleas and let Aiden come home with us. Those were the times when I used to be super happy. I was glad because I finally had my brother to play with again. When we were around three or four, we had begged Dad to get us a swing set in the backyard, which is there even now. So when Aiden came home, the first thing we used to do was play in the backyard and swing on the swings. Although Aiden used to play mostly by himself with his separate set of toys, I just enjoyed being with him. Having him home, he used to not let me touch his things or him and often fought with me if I did take his toys by mistake. Mom and Dad were tired of his behavior, but if I begged them to let him stay just for a little while longer, they used to let him stay at home as long as he didn't behave badly. Mrs. Lee used to look after both of us, especially Aiden, and I knew he hated it just as much as I did. But the longer he stayed, the worse things got. It all usually used to start with a neighbor's dead pet found somewhere around our house. Then Dad's car was keyed. Mrs. Lee found big insects in food containers. Then Mom's pills are swapped with dish soap pills and so on. Mom and Dad used to immediately send him back, and it was boring again. Then Dad and I used to visit him, and I used to beg Dad to give Aiden another chance, which used to be nothing but a repeat of all the previous events. Not just our neighbors, but even Mom and Mrs. Lee had started to be scared of Aiden, as they had faced fatal consequences whenever he was home. And now that Mom is going to have my baby sister, I don't think Aiden is ever coming back home. The doctors who look after Aiden in the mental health facility also think that he should stay there now that the baby is coming home. They help him and give him medicines to cure his illness so that he becomes perfect again, like me. Nevertheless, I'm going to beg Dad to give Aiden one last chance to come home before the baby is out, even though he might get sent back to the hospital again. When he is home, Mom looks at me and tells me what a good boy I am. That's the time when she pays attention to me. Moreover, whenever he is not around, I have to be a really good boy and not do any of those pranks that I love to do whenever he is home. This time, I want to add poison to Mom's food, so my baby sister will die in her stomach and Aiden will be sent back to the hospital. Then, finally, with both of my siblings gone, Mom will look after me again, instead of Mrs. Lee. This happened a few years ago, and I'm proud to say that it has not stopped me from enjoying coffee. But I can't ever have Starbucks again. I'm Mandy, and this is how Starbucks lost me as a customer. I was raised in a conservative Christian home. My parents believed coffee was a sin to drink, and if you drank it, you wouldn't go to heaven. I remember watching TV during my childhood. All the beer and coffee commercials, they made it all look so tempting. I was always so confused that if it was so bad, why did they advertise it on TV? My mom always told me that it was because they were followers of the devil and used those ads to tempt us. I was always drawn to coffee. My first job ever was at a cookie shop and we made coffee smoothies. They were so creamy and smelled amazing. Every time I made one, I would salivate at the idea of having just one taste. One night, after I made one for a customer, I took a spoon and scooped up the extra stuff from the blender and tasted it. I wanted more, but I felt dirty, as though I did something wrong. I never forgot the taste of it and how delicious it was. That perfect blend of bitter and sweet, it was a craving I fought off for years until I became an adult. It started in college. I would always go get an iced coffee with whole milk and caramel from McDonald's. I had a habit of drinking it in the safety of my car as people who went to my church also went to my college. I feared that if they ever saw me drinking coffee, my parents would catch wind of it and I could be shamed. 
Then I graduated college and got my first job in an office. All my coworkers were raving about Starbucks coffee, and it was a thing to submit orders to the assistants who would go grab it. My coworker Ellie is the one who encouraged me to try it, as my inner broke college student kept getting McDonald's. You're getting Starbucks on me today, Mandy. Pick your poison. Ellie showed me a menu she had on her phone. And I looked over the options. She recommended the white chocolate mocha. I'll have the white chocolate mocha then. Ellie wrote down our Starbucks order, and I noticed that she wrote down a lot of customized ingredients in her coffee. That day, I was bitten by the Starbucks bug, and I found myself making customizations of my own on my orders. I was still fairly low on the ranks at my job, so when an assistant called out, I had to fill their shoes. But I didn't mind. It got me out of the office, and I wasn't the only one picking up coffee orders. One day, a few assistants called out, so there was only me and an assistant named Roy. We had a large office and at least 20 coffees we were bringing back. We drove to the Starbucks and began placing orders. When suddenly, a woman who appeared to be in her 60s with a bowl cut bob started yelling at everybody in there. Sinners, you're all sinners. Roy and I glanced at one another as tension flared up in the shop. A barista that was pushing orders came out to the floor to talk to her. Ma'am, you can't come in here and do that. You're scaring the customers. She stared at him with a crazed look I've only ever seen my mother give. Her eyes were wide, and her cheeks began shaking from how tightly she was clenching her jaw. Her gray hair began to frizz from the sweat coming from her pores. I hope I'm scaring them. You all should be scared and ashamed. Then she looked at me and Roy, who were in the middle of getting everyone's coffee orders. How many coffees are you ordering? Roy stood protectively in front of me. It's none of your business. It most certainly is, because God's business is my business. We are commanded not to drink coffee. You two look young and fresh. You have a chance. This lady looked at the teenage barista. You're young too. It's not too late to save yourself. I came out from behind Roy and looked this Karen in the eye. Hey, lady, this is not how you want to convey a message to people you think need Jesus. Commanded to drink coffee or not, we all get agency, and you're commanded not to take that away from anyone. I know because I grew up with those same beliefs. Let people make their choices and go focus on yourself. She stared daggers at me. Her lips twitched into a sinister smile as she pulled a handgun out of her purse and pointed it at me. She pulled the trigger, striking me in the shoulder, and I fell to the floor, blood spurting out of my arm. Roy hovered over me as this lady opened fire on a few more people in the shop, including the poor barista that tried to tell her to leave. I blacked out and woke up in the hospital. To my surprise, Roy was there. Roy? Hey, you woke up. What happened? You were shot. Thankfully, it wasn't fatal. Were you shot? No, I ducked down to protect you. The barista kid never made it, and a couple others were injured, but okay. Oh my God, that is horrible. Roy explained that the cops had already been on their way. As the second the woman started yelling, the manager had called the cops. The Karen was arrested, and the local Starbucks shut down for a while due to the crime that was committed, repairs that needed to be made. And grieving the loss of a kid trying to earn money. I grew up in a comparatively rich family. My dad had a successful business, and my mom was a lawyer. However, my parents made it a point to raise me in a humble setting, which meant I had to get a job and earn my own pocket money. 
Back then, I was fascinated by coffee and decided to work as a barista at Starbucks. Although I was still in high school, I loved my part-time job at the local Starbucks, and the money I earned was great as well. A few months into my job, I was in my senior year of high school, and a very beautiful girl showed up in Starbucks one night. She had raven black hair, piercing blue eyes, and pale skin. She looked like a movie star to me. She was wearing a modest dress and ordered a simple coffee. I served the order and continued to work, but my eyes kept going toward her. She sat on the last table and just sipped at her coffee in peace. Later, when the store was about to close, she just got up, left some tips on the table, and walked away. From that day on, this girl used to come every night to the Starbucks and leave just before the store used to close. And one of my co-workers had a massive crush on her, but we did not dare talk to her. We knew that she was maybe a few years older than us, but she was stunning nonetheless. On my 18th birthday, just a few days before graduation, my parents decided to surprise me with a new car. It was nothing fancy, just a Ford Mustang. Back then, having my own car was a big deal. I took my car everywhere from then on, to school, to parties, and even to work. One day, as I was cleaning the platforms just before the store was about to close, I saw the same raven-haired girl walk in. By now, I had her order by heart and placed it even before she could say it out loud. Once I had given her the coffee, I continued with my work. Sometime later, she left, and I and my buddy locked up the store and left too. While I was driving home, I saw the girl just standing a block away from Starbucks. I had a nice car, and to be honest, I wanted to show it off a bit. So, I decided to ask the girl if she wanted a lift home. I slowed the car down beside her on the road and spoke. Hey, do you need a lift home? For a few seconds, she looked at me funny, and once she recognized me from the store, she smiled and said, Oh, really? Would you drop me off at home? I was 18 and a bit stupid, so I replied, Yeah, why not? Hop on in and just let me know where you live. She sat on the passenger's side and told me where she lived. Although she lived on the other side of town, I was delighted to spend some time with her. So, you still in high school? Yeah, it's my senior year. Mmm, high school is a good time in your life. You should enjoy it while you can. After that, life hits hard. I was a bit naive to understand what she meant back then, but... I was just glad that she was with me and I could get to tell all my friends the next day that I gave her a ride home. What do you do? I dared to ask. I used to go to college. Why did you leave? Because there was nothing left for me there. Her cryptic talks were a bit confusing, but I didn't mind much. What do you want to do after high school? Well, I'm planning to go to the university. I was hoping to get a sports scholarship. That's good. Get out of this stupid small town while you can. Or else, like some of us, you'll be stuck here forever. I truly was clueless about what she meant at that point, so I decided to keep quiet and drive towards her home. For the rest of the ride, she was quiet and kept on looking out of the window. When we reached the address she had told me, I got out of the car and opened the door for her. She thanked me and walked away in the direction of a small house, which was probably the only house in that block. I got in my car and started driving back home. Midway through the ride, my eyes drifted toward the passenger seat, and I saw a silk scarf lying there. Crap. Looks like she forgot her scarf. I decided to turn around and return the scarf to her. I knew where she lived, anyways. After about ten minutes, I was at her doorstep, holding her scarf in one hand and knocking on the door with the other. An elderly man opened the door. He looked as if he was about 70 years old. Hello, sir. I'm Matthias, and I dropped off your daughter here tonight. I think she left her scarf in the car, and I'm here to return it to her. Before I could complete my sentence, an elderly woman came and stood beside the man. It was clear that the man and the woman were husband and wife, and from their facial features, I also figured out that they were related to the girl from Starbucks. They were perhaps her parents, I guess. The woman looked at me for a while and snatched the scarf from my hand and began crying into it. I was confused as to what was going on. The man, too, had tears in his eyes. 
I think you should come inside. Sure, sir. I was a bit hesitant at first, but eventually followed them inside. Sit here, son. The old man made me sit in his living room. The woman had disappeared somewhere in the home. How did you meet my daughter, son? The man reappeared with a cup of coffee for me. She visits the Starbucks I work at almost every night, so today I decided to drop her off here, but she forgot her scarf. Ten years back, my daughter was returning home from the Starbucks you work at when she met with an accident. A drunk guy was behind the wheel, and we lost our only child. From that year onward, at least one of the Starbucks employees comes here claiming to have met our daughter. She is dead, son, and I don't know who you met or who you dropped off here. I agree the scarf you brought is indeed hers, but if you see her again, please do not talk or interact with her. We do not want you to get hurt. I was stunned after hearing the man's confession, and I left the place, shell-shocked. As I got back in the car to drive home, I felt as if someone was sitting in the back seat. I checked if anyone was there, but the seat was empty. I started the car and left the place. While I was on the highway, I looked in the rearview mirror, and she was sitting in the back seat. I was so terrified that I lost control of the car and crashed into the divider. Although I was in an accident, I was not hurt. I got out of my car, which was completely smashed from the front, and saw another car opposite to me. This car had crashed into a tree too, but upon closer inspection I noticed that the driver had passed out and was probably drunk too. Plus, he was driving his car on the wrong side of the road. If the girl had not appeared in my rearview mirror, this guy would have crashed into me and I would have been killed as well. Looked like the girl saved my life that night. For the next couple of days I kept an eye out for the black-haired girl, but she never showed up in the Starbucks or anywhere else. Finally, I graduated and moved on with my life, not giving a second thought to the incident. But even now, whenever I visit my hometown, I make it a point to buy a coffee from the Starbucks I used to work in, in the hopes to meet the ghost of the beautiful, raven-haired girl again. Roy and I started dating as I was very moved by how protective he was in the coffee shop and admitted to having a crush on me. We made a mutual agreement to leave the office as everyone, including Ellie, sadly were all going crazy without their beloved Starbucks. The coffee there was good, but it wasn't enough to make me want to enter another Starbucks again. Even driving by Starbucks gives me PTSD. Roy found a job that he enjoyed doing welding, and I found another office where I was respected more. People brought their own Starbucks into work, and even though the smell of the coffees was a bit triggering, at least they went out and got it themselves. As I said, I still enjoy coffee, but I get it from small businesses or Dunkin' Donuts, and yes, I'll still even go to McDonald's for it. Be careful, folks. Coffee is on the list of major no-nos to conservative Christians, and you never know how far one will go to prove their point. If you ever come across a Karen like Roy and I did, tread carefully and don't set them off the way I did. You may just risk your life. This happened a long time ago, when I and my friends were in college. We were a tight-knit group of four friends, and all of us living in different states. None of us lived in the state that our university was in, and we all had a hard time during the holidays as hardly any one of us could go back home to celebrate with our parents. In our last year, just like the previous years, none of us could make it back home for Thanksgiving, which meant we were all stuck in our dorm rooms eating Chinese takeout and playing video games. Being four boys, none of us were keen on cooking or making Thanksgiving a bit more traditional. We were all happy lounging on the couch and eating our ordered food. We were all aware that hardly anyone was present in the university, as most of the students and staff members were home celebrating Thanksgiving. That's when Mike, one of my friends who is also a thrill-seeking horror enthusiast, thought it would be a brilliant idea to visit the art department building and play a Ouija board game there. Although I was not a believer in the paranormal, 
I was the only one hesitant about this plan. Steph and Austin were just as excited about this plan as Mike was, so reluctantly, I agreed too. Now, there is something you should know about the art department building in our university before I proceed with this story. Our university was established in the mid-1900s. Back then, it was the leading university to learn any type of art form. But in the throes of its popularity, one of the students back then committed suicide in the main hall of the art department building, which eventually led to the downfall of that department of our university. The situation became so bad that the dean of our university had to close the art department a few decades ago. Since then, the whole building is shut down, never to be visited or reopened. Also, there is a rumor on campus that the art department building is cursed or has evil energy. We've been dying to see whether the rumors were true or not since our first year. And now, it seemed like the perfect time. That night, we snuck out of our dorm rooms and into the art department building. Despite having seen this building so many times while going from class to class, it still felt different when we actually stepped into it. It sent a chill down my spine. Despite the weather being warm outside, it was strangely chilling inside. Mike, being the enthusiastic one of us, started to explore the interior of the building. Steph, Austin, and I were close behind him. When you think about a department being shut down in a university, you expect the authorities to dispose of all the instruments and other important stuff in the building. But in this case, the classrooms and the halls of this department had all its stuff still intact. Right up to the painting canvases and brushes in some classrooms. Why would they have done that? It's said that the evil energy in this place became so heavy on the people working here that they had to shut off and seal this building almost overnight. Steph said out of nowhere, answering the question in my mind. How the hell do you know this, Steph? Austin asked. I'm a history major, remember? So during our lectures, one of our professors who's been teaching here for years told us the story of the art department. Or rather the fall of the art department. Steph answered. Ah, this place would be perfect, Mike exclaimed. Austin and I exchanged a glance looking at the spot Mike had chosen. It was none other than the infamous main hall of the building in which it's said the student had killed himself. They say the reason the student died here was that he was into black magic, and to excel ahead of his peers, he summoned the devil in one of his rituals to ask him for great progress in art. But something happened and his ritual went really wrong, resulting in his death. Some even speculate that the devil took his life as a payment and now roams the halls and classrooms of this place. Mike said, I think this all could be a lie. I mean, I understand the student committing suicide, but you don't think the stories about him summoning the devil and all are true. I mean, the poor lad could simply be depressed or could have had some mental illness. I was a bit scared after hearing Mike's hypothesis, so I wish to present a fairly reasonable one. Well, if what you say is true, then that doesn't explain the misfortune of the art department after the student's death. Mike argued with me while setting up the Ouija board. Austin and Steph were busy inspecting the paintings in the main hall. Plus, Mike's counter-argument had left me speechless, so I just decided to take my seat on one side of the board. Soon, all three of my friends had joined me. Mike, being the most involved one, explained the rules, and we began our so-called experiment. For the first hour, Mike and Austin kept on asking questions, but we didn't receive any response. As time ticked by, I was becoming more and more confident about my theory that there was no ghost or evil spirit or devil lurking in the building. It was just an urban legend, let alone a rumor created by students and the staff to keep themselves entertained on campus. By the mark of one and a half hours, even Mike was ready to give up. The coin on the Ouija board had not moved even an inch. There was no noise or any sign or indication that there was someone other than us in that building. Guys, I think we should leave. It's almost three in the morning, and I want to get some sleep before my football practice tomorrow. Steph was the star football player on campus, so no doubt he was the first one to suggest we abandon this stupidity and retire back to our dorm rooms. Right then, Mike asked what felt like the last question of the night. If there's anyone here other than us who doesn't belong to this world, give us a sign. We were all bored and a bit sleepy so it was an eye-opening moment when a loud knock came from the farthest corner of the room. 
I again looked at Austin, who was just as stunned as I was. But before we could say anything, Mike repeated his question, and another knock was heard somewhere to our left. Although Mike was thrilled at the prospect of finally getting a reply, I was scared from within, as I could sense whatever it was that was answering Mike's questions wasn't good. Further, he asked, Did you cause the downfall of this art department? Knock once for no and twice for yes. Immediately, we heard two knocks coming from two completely different directions. At this point, Austin and Steph were no longer as thrilled as Mike, but rather starting to get scared. I should have told you guys that Steph was the most religious one of us all, and he had read the Bible a couple of times. So when he looked visibly scared, we knew this wasn't good. But Mike wasn't done yet. He kept on asking questions and receiving replies in the form of knocks. With every knock, we were losing our calm. After a while of random questions, Mike suddenly asked, Is there a heaven? There was only one knock in response to this which meant the answer was no. At that point, I felt a hand on my shoulder pulling me to my feet, which turned out to be Steph. He hauled up each one of us and said three words in a stern voice. We should leave. The seriousness in his voice needed no explanation. Everyone, along with Mike, snuck out of the art department building and back into our dorm rooms. Once we were secured in the four walls of our room, Mike finally asked Steph, why did you abruptly stop me and ask us to leave? I wanted to know a lot more. I still remember the answer Steph gave to Mike. Anything paranormal that denies the existence of heaven is pure and utter evil. Which means, whatever that was that was answering your questions was so evil that it could harm us at any time. We had to get out of there. After that night, None of us spoke about the art department building or shared our experience with other students or faculty on campus. But from that day onwards, I started believing in God. That night when I lay in bed, I was thankful for a lot of things. Mostly, I was thankful for the amazing life I was gifted on this wonderful planet. This incident didn't happen to me, but it happened to my father. You see, I'm a bit of an introvert, but my dad is an extrovert, which means he loves to meet new people and interact with them. He never believed in paranormal things until this incident. So, a few years ago, my father was visiting our native place, which is a small coastal town with a population of a few hundred people. In small towns, usually everyone knows everyone, and our native town is no exception to this rule. Although my grandfather, that is, my dad's dad, moved to the city many years ago with his wife and children, many of his family members still live in our native town, even today, and no doubt all of them adore my father. My dad loves to go to the beach in the morning and just watch the waves in peace. So whenever he visits our native place, he goes to the beach in the morning. That day as well, he was standing on the beach. It was low tide, so the water had receded into the ocean, leaving a huge patch of wet sand in its wake. My dad wished to wet his feet in the water, so he walked to the waves and started walking parallel to the beach. Now, as I mentioned earlier, my father has many acquaintances in the village, so it was no news that he used to meet a few people on his morning stroll on the beach. One more thing you should know is that on the far side of the beach, where the beach ends, is a cemetery. Most of the people who die are buried in that cemetery and no one ever goes there except when someone is dead. As my father was walking enjoying the scenery in the cold water, he noticed a man waving at him from the tree line. The tree line was the area that marked the start of the beach. He thought that it might be someone he knew, so Dad waved back. You must note that the distance was so far that he couldn't see the man's face. Dad kept walking and didn't pay much attention to the man, thinking that it must be someone from the village who would have seen my dad walking on the beach. A few moments later, when he looked in the direction of the man in the tree line, he didn't spot him. Instead, he saw the man almost a few yards away. Now, this may seem like a normal event, but the surprising part was that the man had crossed a very long distance in seconds, which was practically impossible, even if he had a vehicle at his disposal. This stunned my dad, and moreover, the man was almost near the old cemetery. 
He was still looking at my dad and waving at him like before, but now he also seemed to call dad towards the place where he was standing. As my dad didn't believe in ghosts or the paranormal, he didn't think twice and started walking towards the cemetery. Till then, the man had walked into it. Dad finally reached the cemetery and entered it too. He started looking for the man, but he couldn't find a soul in the cemetery. So he eventually walked back to the beach and home. Later that evening, as he was in the market looking for things, he saw the same man across the street waving at him. This time, even though Dad could see the man's face, he couldn't recollect where he had seen him before. This time, instead of approaching the man, he just walked away. Later that night, when my father was visiting his uncle, he decided to mention the weird incident to see if his uncle knew who the man was. Hi, uncle. He won't believe it, but today the strangest thing happened. I was taking my morning walk on the beach when a guy was waving at me. I first thought he must be an acquaintance from the village, but later he suddenly appeared near the old cemetery and started calling to me. Please tell me you did not follow him into the cemetery. Uncle Yosef asked my father. Well, I did. You foolish boy. My 85-year-old Uncle Yosef almost yelled at my father. Did you find him in the cemetery? He asked again. No. No one was in the cemetery when I reached it. So I completed the walk and came back home. Did you see the man again anywhere? Yes, I saw him earlier this evening in the market. Did you approach him? No. Why? What's the matter? Please tell me clearly. If you see this man again, please run away from him. Do not go near him. Or if you see the man approaching you, just get away from him. It's a curse. Whoever visits the cemetery by following the waving man starts to see this man in different places. This man will try to approach you and call you towards him. If the man reaches you, he will kill you in the most gruesome way possible. Many years ago, a woman from our village was cursed too, and somehow the waving man reached her, and she died in an accident on the same day. It's said that once you get cursed, there is no way to undo it. All you can do is make sure the man is away from you at all costs, or you die. And you, my boy, are cursed. Listening to his uncle, Dad was shocked beyond words. It's been years since this incident, and my father still sees the man and keeps his distance from him. Although he is the only one who can see this man, it's truly terrifying to see him live with this curse. Running is the only way he can survive and make sure this evil spirit does not get him. This story starts in the early months of 1974 when the DeFeo family moved into a new house. This house was big enough to accommodate all seven of them. To an outsider looking at the DeFeo family, everything seemed to be great for all the members of the household, but this was far from the truth. Not many knew the reality of the DeFeo family. Robert DeFeo Sr., the man of the house, was an abusive man. He abused his kids and wife. Although, and the kids kept trying to make friends and settle down into their new home, things were made exceedingly difficult due to the constant abuse in the house. The eldest son, Robert DeFeo Jr., was no exception to the daily abuse and was tired of his father's behavior before they moved in to the new house. Since the day the DeFeo family settled into the house, Robert had started to feel a weird vibe in the house, as if something wasn't quite right about it. Although initially he dismissed the feeling and tried to be a part of his family as much as he could, with passing months, this feeling started to weigh heavy on the young man. Even before the move, Robert Jr. was known to be an alcoholic and a troubled young man who even indulged in substance abuse and could not hold a job for too long. 
That behavior resulted in more tension between the father and the son. To get his life back on track, the parents of Robert Jr. decided to let him live with them in this new house. But little did they know the consequence of their discussion. Around mid-May, Robert Jr. lost yet another job due to his recklessness and lack of responsibility, making his already hot-headed dad furious. That night, when Robert Jr. returned home intoxicated from the bar, he and his father had the worst argument to date. It had escalated so much that the son had threatened his father with a gun, while the whole family, along with his youngest sibling, who was nine at the time, watched the entire exchange in utter shock and fear. Although Robert Jr. had never hurt his siblings and was always nice to all of them, his attitude towards his mother wasn't good. He blamed her for not doing anything against their father when he abused her as well as her kids. Life for the DeFeo family was just as tough in the new home as it was in their old one. Robert Jr., on the other hand, had been getting worse with each passing day. His drinking had increased. He visited the local bar more than he visited his home or his job. He had gotten into drugs, and the frequency of his arguments with his parents had increased, too. Nobody could figure out what was causing such behavior in the young man. Although, Initially, they blamed it on the new environment. Soon it became clear to the family that there was more to his troubles than he let on. As the months passed and the winter arrived, things had not changed one bit for the DeFeo family. The fights and the abuse were constant, and it did not seem like it would stop until the oldest son moved out or the father passed away. On the 13th of November, 1974, a call was made by Robert Jr. to the sheriff's office at about three in the morning, stating that he had discovered the dead bodies of his entire family scattered throughout their home. He said that someone had shot his parents and four younger siblings while they were asleep in their respective beds. When the police arrived, none of them had any idea of the sinister deed they were soon to uncover. As informed by Robert Jr., his entire family was dead, shot to death by a 35 caliber rifle. When asked where he was during the murder of his family, he calmly said that he was at the local bar and returned home to the horrific scene in front of him. Given his past, the cops did not believe him and brought him in for questioning. During the questioning and the long court cases that followed, everything changed. The cops began the case thinking that it was a murder committed by an unknown criminal. But as the detectives progressed, new evidence unfolded. It was quickly clear that the murderer was none other than Robert Jr. At first glance, the investigators thought Robert Jr. might have killed his family because of his hate towards his parents and mostly his father. But what did not add up was that his siblings he claimed to love dearly he murdered in cold blood. When he was questioned, he admitted that something paranormal was happening in their house all along. The story he narrated was not only unbelievable, but also made everyone question his sanity. Since the day I entered that house, I felt as if there was a presence in the house beside the seven of us. The presence was like a soft, dark shadow that I saw at first, but as I spent more time in the house... This dark shadow started to take up a concrete shape, and as the months passed, it was as if this evil presence had attached itself to me. 
It saw me as its weapon, as its tool to destruction. It provoked me to do things I would never otherwise do. It would ask me to hurt people with the machinery at my job site. It became increasingly hard to focus on work while this presence was constantly talking in my head. That's why I quit my job. Drinking helped to shut this presence out for a while, and drugs helped even more. But as my father constantly fought with me, it was increasingly tough to deal with my dad and his evil presence. And that night, the presence went a step further and showed itself to me. It was a hideous-looking demon with a deformed face, blood-red eyes, and almost no facial features. It was as tall as a tree and could change its form into whatever it wanted to be. It knew my dad had a rifle in the basement. I wanted to end things and get my peace of mind back, so I grabbed the rifle and shot at the demon. It soon took the shape of our dog, but as I shot the dog, the demon escaped and went upstairs. It took the form of my parents, whom I shot to death. But the demon was still present, and it took the form of my siblings next, resulting in me shooting each one of them. As I realized the gravity of my situation, the demon was coaxing me to shoot myself too. But after that, I decided to visit the bar to shut down the evil force for a while. But I could not justify my actions, and that is why I ended up calling the cops. I regret what that voice made me do, but I guarantee you that the house is haunted, and anyone who lives there will face the same fate, or worse, as the evil presence there will make them do things as it made me kill my family. Robert Jr.'s confession did not hold much weight in court, and he was not declared insane. Therefore, Robert Jr. was sentenced to death for his crimes. And the chapter about the DeFeo family ended with him. Now, I know you must be wondering who I am and why I'm telling you this story. I am the realtor who had been trying to sell the house of the DeFeo family for years. And the house is none other than the infamous Amityville. Although my opinion does not hold any power in court, I want to share it here with you people. I have been inside that house many times, and I agree with Robert Jr. and believe that what he was saying was true. There is a dark energy in the house, and you can feel it when you're there. I feel it every time I go there. And a time or two, I had also seen the shadowy figure of Robert Jr., which others have mentioned before. It does not justify his doing, but I think the place was haunted from the get-go. The thing that makes me the saddest is the fact that innocent blood had been shed in the house, making it even more scary than any other haunted house ever. You saw that page with me. You know what they can do to us, don't you? One had his location on, and he was getting closer. We should get out of here, now. You're right. We must get out of here. Suddenly, the power goes out. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Is it just here? No. It's the whole block. That doesn't mean it's not them. We must hide. They gotta be close. Turn off the phone. If they're hacking us, they'll know we're here. Good idea. We both turned off our cell phones and hid in the house. Maybe there was no one outside, or maybe we were fine. But there was too much going on at the same time. It could be dangerous. Suddenly, we heard the doorbell. Obviously, we didn't go to the door, but to the window. Luke, don't let them see you. We shouldn't even look out. Shut up. What if it's my family? Hey, wait. How did your doorbell ring if there's no energy in the house? There's something strange going on here. Do not peek. Without paying attention, I peeked out anyway. But when I did, I realized I didn't have to. 
As soon as I raised my head, my gaze collided with that of a man at his face against the window. This person was wearing a Will Smith mask. Behind him, there were dozens of people milling around my yard, all wearing different masks of the actor. All of these people had red chalk, making strange circles and drawing things. Uh, with a scream, I jumped back and turned on my cell phone to call the police. As it turned on, someone started banging on the front door nervously. My friend and I ran down the stairs and locked ourselves in the dark, in my parents' room. We both held our breath and listened as suddenly the front door opened and footsteps began to sound in the house. We heard several footsteps up the stairs, and some passed very close to my parents' room. Luckily, I had a pretty big house, but sooner or later, we would be discovered. The footsteps in the house sounded more and more distant. I think they were in my room. I took this opportunity to run to my father's closet and grab the small key to the room. And as soon as I locked the door, I began to hear someone on the other side trying to open it. I held my breath and closed my eyes. Helen also did his best not to give away our position, but he was much more nervous than I was. He was crying, covering his mouth with his hands. Without much effort, the person on the other side gave up and just walked away. Okay. I, I don't think they're here anymore. I'm sure they are still in the house waiting for us. What should we do? This may sound dangerous, but our only option is to go out the window of this room and jump into the courtyard. Are you crazy? We could break a bone. Oh, come on, Alan. Is this a joke? Would you rather we get caught by these psychopaths? Besides, it's, it's only a second floor. We'll be fine. We both headed to the window to escape, but something interrupted us. At that moment, we didn't realize but we weren't alone. Hooper, there's someone here, he said, terrified, pointing into the darkness. When I looked in the direction Alan was pointing, I fell to the floor in fear. A dark silhouette was staring at us from the corner of the room. It was pitch black and we couldn't see anything, but this silhouette was not one of the masked men. It was more than two meters tall, imposing, corpulent, it was so dark that we couldn't see its body. For a moment, I, I thought it was just a trick of our imagination. But whatever was there was something real because something gave it away. His eyes. His red eyes glowed in the dark and followed every move we made. Suddenly, we started to get very hot. The place felt like an oven. We felt the agitated breathing of this being closer and closer, and those glowing eyes were just inches away from us. As our attacker approached, one would think that being so close, we'd be able to see the silhouette better. But no, it was still dark. At that moment, I realized that it wasn't that we couldn't see that being because the lights were off. It was because that being had no form. That being was a shadow. I tried to run as fast as I could, but my legs didn't work. I was paralyzed. The being walked closer and closer, and luckily for me, Alan was closer to it. Alan was closer to it. As it came into contact with my friend, the shadow grabbed his face with just its fingers and smashed it. Alan couldn't move. He couldn't scream, but I could tell by the way he was shaking that he was still alive. He was terrified. The shadow opened its mouth and began to swallow my friend's body whole. While all this was happening, Alan regained the ability to move, but it was too late. He could only see his feet in desperation as he was swallowed alive. At that moment, I realized that I could move too, so I took the opportunity to run to the window and jump out of it. I fell into the courtyard and broke my arm, but that didn't stop me from running. I ran as fast as I could, and the only time I turned around, the men with the Will Smith masks were still there, looking at me without trying to catch me. When I returned home with the police and my parents, no one could believe what they saw. My whole house was full of satanic drawings. The door to my parents' room was intact. No one had entered but it had a strange black lipstick drawing on it that was different from the gaudy red they used in the rest of the house. When we entered my parents' room, 
There was nothing there. The room was an empty square. Not only was my friend not there, but there was no furniture, no paint, nothing. It made no sense. Alan's disappearance was labeled a kidnapping. When I logged back into my social networks, all those people had stopped following me, and I never heard from them again. After some research, I found out that there were many of these satanic sects that did rituals and human sacrifices of people who were too curious. Whatever the case, I never went back to the deep web. I never went back to look for anything from these people. I had seen enough, and as long as they didn't come back for me, I was happy. It started out like any other day. I went out to the front yard after breakfast, ready to do some climbing as usual. I kicked off my shoes and took off my socks, since I was more adept at climbing while barefoot. Then I made my way up the tree trunk and grabbed onto the lowest branch I could. Closing my eyes, I decided to just dangle there in the air, enjoying the wind brushing against my face. After five minutes, I heard something digging into the tree trunk below me. I looked down, and to my surprise, I saw a bald man with gray skin and a black coat sitting cross-legged at the base of the tree. At least, it looked like a man. He was etching something into the tree with his sharp nails, but I couldn't see what it was. Instead of calling out for my grandma, I stupidly asked him, do you need any help? The man looked up at me with his orange eyes and smiled. Almost as if he were happy, I acknowledged his existence. And then his smile grew wider, revealing his razor-sharp teeth. Why, yes, child. I do need help. I'm so hungry right now. So why don't you drop down into my arms? So I can eat you. He said in a raspy voice. My face went pale after hearing those words and seeing his monstrous teeth. I was so scared that I just froze, clinging to the branch a little tighter while my bare feet dangled above his head. Whoever this guy was, he clearly wasn't human. It wasn't until the man stood up and began to reach for my legs with his inhumanly long arms that I snapped out of my daze. I quickly brought my legs up and over the branch, then started climbing for my life. The man laughed like a maniac as he started climbing after me. Now, I was pretty confident in my climbing abilities since I had two major advantages over him. I was smaller and I had bare feet. Also, you'd think he would have trouble climbing a tree at his age, but surprisingly, he was on my heels within seconds. And I mean, he was literally snapping his teeth at my heels while I climb, like some kind of animal. It took every ounce of concentration I had not to stumble and fall into his clutches. As I continued to climb, he'd say things like, I'm gonna get you. You better climb faster, sweetie. Just to scare me and make me lose my footing. But I just tuned out his words and focused on the climb. All I could hear were the soles of my bare feet, slapping one branch after another as I moved with a sense of life-threatening urgency. There were one or two times when my foot slipped off a branch due to my state of panic and not getting a proper foothold on the tree. And in those moments, the man didn't hesitate to try and bite my foot while it dangled in the air above his head. But thankfully, my fear kept me going, and I always managed to pull my feet back up in time. So close! Almost had you there! <laughs> He'd laugh, enjoying the chase. After climbing halfway up the tree, I looked down to see if he was still there, but he was gone. Not a single trace was left of him. 
and grab both of my ankles, pulling my feet out from under me and causing me to fall on my back. Before I knew it, I was hoisted into the air, dangling upside down by my feet. I frantically looked up to see the creature's horrifying face smiling down at me. I don't know how it reached the top before I did. I didn't even see it pass me. This thing's movements defied logic. I win! It said while licking its teeth. Now for my prize! The creature then opened its mouth inhumanly wide, revealing hundreds of sharp teeth. It then slowly brought my feet up to its open maw, ready to devour me. I screamed at the top of my lungs as I kicked my legs frantically, trying to free myself, but to no avail. I was only saved when my grandma came outside after I screamed. The creature quickly dropped me before disappearing without a trace, almost as if it never existed. I got out of that tree so fast and ran straight into my grandmother's arms sobbing uncontrollably. I tried to explain to her what I'd seen, but she didn't believe me. Years have passed since then, but I'll never forget that thing's face for as long as I live. A storm was blowing and it was raining heavily on the way. I stood near that house. I thought about when the rain may decrease I can go home after that. I was waiting at the door of that unfamiliar house. Then I heard the sound from that house. Its door was closed. Someone was saying, You can come in, my dear, because it's raining heavily outside. It was the voice of an old man. Who's inside? Hello? I asked. Then he replied, Rain is not gonna stop. Don't wait outside. Come in, come in. Thank you, sir, but I think it's decreasing. I'll move on after it stops. I said. He forced me again, saying, It won't stop. I said come in, boy. No one is inside. You are all alone. <laughs> I got confused when he said that. I again asked, What do you mean by that, sir? You're inside, right? I got no reply. Hello? Hello? Sir? Then I heard a scream and I got terrified. The door of that house opened automatically and I went inside flying in the air. It was as if the wind carried me inside. I reached inside the house and screamed. The house was very old inside and it was dark. Along with this, a lot of negative energy was also being felt in the house. I ran outside, then I thought maybe that old man would be in trouble and I should go inside the house again to help him. My senses told me not to enter this house, but I overcame my fear and entered inside. There was a haunting atmosphere. I saw no one there, then I got very scared and confused about who asked me to get inside. I was curious to explore that house. I went upstairs and through the portal-like doorway. I felt like I was in another horrifying dimension. As I proceeded, I heard ghostly sounds and saw writings on the walls and even heard children laughing and crying. <laughs> Doors were slamming hardly themselves. Then I saw a shadow before me, which was approaching a room before me. I was sweating. I turned back to get out of there, but as I turned, I saw another shadow coming upstairs. I was petrified. I ran ahead and entered another room. Everything in the room was shattered. It seemed like there had been no one for many years. But only one question was disturbing me. Who told me to get inside while I was standing outside? And now where is he? Then I heard banging on the door. Who? Who is there? Hello? S sir? Then I heard the same voice. 
You can't go from here. You can't. <laughs> Then the door opened itself, and I saw a shadow coming inside the room. I tried to swallow, but my mouth seemed drier. I was standing still. The shadow came even closer to me, and suddenly it touched me. I closed my eyes with fear and fright. As I managed to open my eyes, I saw the worst sight of my life. That shadow. Now it was so close, I could hear its breathing. I was sweating and death was standing near me. As a dog barked outside the house, the shadow rippled and vanished. As it vanished, it touched my head and I fainted. The last thing I saw was the word die written on the wall. So I got up and tried to run outside, but suddenly I saw an old man enter the house and his scream was horrifying. He ran upstairs and vanished. I heard an odd sound way off in some distance. It sounded like this. Not your home. My home. Not your home. I tried to ignore the sound at first, but I could not. Finally, I decided to get out and investigate the sound. I followed that voice. When I opened a room's door, the sound became louder. Not your home, my home, not your home. Then I walked down the hallway, then the sound got louder. Not your home, my home, not your home. I headed to the hallway very fast. Now it was even louder. Not your home, my home, not your home. And when I got into the dining room, it was so loud. Not your home, my home, not your home. The sound was coming from the corner of the room, I realized. I walked in that direction. Not your home. My home, not your home. There was a chest of drawers in the corner. The sound was very dangerous now. Not your home, my home, not your home. Then I opened the top drawer. There was nothing. Not your home. My home, not your home. I opened the second drawer. There was nothing there. Only... Not your home, my home, not your home. Finally, I opened the bottom drawer, and there I saw something strange, such that the voice stopped coming. It was a roll of wrapping paper in it. It was covered with blood. Then the door of the house opened, and with the same pressure, the wind picked me up and dragged me out of that house. I was screaming, flying in the air within seconds, lying in the mud outside the house. By now the rain had stopped. What I saw shook me to the core. This was Amityville, infamous for ghosts, it was still lit up. I got up and quickly ran from there. Was it the paper roll that was speaking? No, I don't think so. It's not possible. Who was that old man? I think no one could investigate the reason. What do you think? Who helped me? And whose screams were those?